photo a help desk portal already had a web developer spend 20 minutes so that when they submit the so yeah so when the, when they submit the trouble ticket on you know their portal it actually in the background just fills out this form and presses enter um, at the bottom and so this is the whole user interface name email address phone number helpful comment the internet is slow mail is broken Google is down you know whatever the user's random experience is right which often is not very helpful from hypervisors broken. hypervisors broken yeah the network is down and you're sending email. Uh, my hypervisor is broken. Can you help me? <laughs> <laughs> they're just going to call it it's slow. It's slow. That's all they're going to say. And you know, it's, it's very, you know, it's kind of like there's a million things that, that it could actually be the problem. And what's also interesting is, is that slowness may be very transitory. You know, it may be gone by the time you actually get to look at it or somebody from the help desk looks at it. And so what these recordings do is actually preserve the state of the union, if you will, at the time that they were having a, uh, an issue and give you a chance to catch it. And in many cases, I would say that it's not actually an infrastructure issue, right? I mean, the classic VDI problem is, is that all the lights are green, but the users are complaining. You know, what's your next move? Because, I mean, the hosts are very rarely out of RAM. The hosts are not out of CPU horsepower. Um, there's a... You know, the most expensive storage that money can buy sitting in the rack, you know, all carefully tiered with SSD and everything else inside most of your deployments, and yet the users still call and complain. And so, the, um, you know, the, the, the question... It helps you point the finger back to the app guy. Well, and sometimes it's actually the user, right? Because when you're supporting desktops, the reality is, is that people still crash their browser. People still get web applications that are poorly written that consume all the RAM inside their system, right? They don't reboot their desktop for a moment. Ever. Um, you know, all of those things still occur, and so to the degree that it's possible to actually go into that desktop and actually get some of that information out, um, that would be pretty cool. And so what I'll do with... How many recordings can this thing hold, and how often can you restart a recording? Ah, great questions. The, we like, it's worth repeating because you have the mic. I have the mic. And not only that, yeah. is it something that is on by default? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, so the, the question uh, was, was basically, how many recordings can I have? Um, do you have to turn them on manually or do they automatically go? In other words, is there, are there scalability things? What are the, the concerns that I should have around using this feature? Um, we like for you to think of recordings as free. Uh, the system can actually hold between 10 and 15,000 of them from a user-generated perspective. Um, so that would be pressing the little red button an awful lot from a manual perspective. Uh, the system actually maintains all of its automated recordings in a separate partition than that. So, you know, for practical intents and purposes, it's unlimited. It's not actually, of course, because we don't just consume all of your sand or something ridiculous like that. Um, it's important to realize that these recordings, we're not actually saving the data, right? We've got a summarized view of it in terms of, you know, we don't need the payload of the packets, for instance. That's what I mean. You know, we've got the header information, but we don't need the payload, so it doesn't grow out of control. It's fairly compressible inside of our system. Yes, Mike? Can I ask, um, again, there's been an emphasis there on VDI as, as a usage case. Can you speak, say, to people who are doing virtualization for server-based consolidation? How would the Zingati play, play into that kind of way of what he's doing virtualization? It, many of the, the things end up, you know, being very, very mm -hmm. similar in terms of, you know, if you if you're the guy who's running, um, you know, I'm just I, I'm just thinking of a of a situation that I was just dealing with just a week or so ago on a call with somebody, and the main complaint they had was uh, their CEO and the executive staff were having email problems. So you know, it's just classic Exchange virtualization right on the server. And everything looks fine. There's tons of RAM, you know, everything else. The exchange team is by and large happy, but you know, there's these negative experiences from important people. And so we started doing some, some digging around the virtual infrastructure. No CPU problems, uh, no RAM problems. Um, interesting, notice some strange spikes of network activity. Well, we, we kind of dug into it and uh, you know, found that uh, the largest bit of network traffic during the business day was actually one of their backup systems. Mm -hmm. And you know they had a backup that actually was starting at 11 o'clock at night like it was supposed to, but it wasn't actually concluding until 5 in the afternoon, right as the users went home. <laughs> And so, um, you know, since that was going against the main mail server, you know, it, this capability of seeing the interactions and of being able to track multiple metrics simultaneously for an object 
works just as well on the uh, the server side yeah. as okay. it does. So um, if, you, if you know if Andrew pulls up the, the VI dashboard, um, a couple of things that that probably will stand out for you guys in terms of live visualization. Like if you go to the monitor tab, um, one of the things that our our server admins really love doing is again we we bucketize things into classes. You know VMs and data stores, um, hosts. So for any individual metric, literally live and continuously, we're updating. Again, if you go, even on the BDI dashboard, if you go to each of latency is one of the, the biggest challenges and the hardest things for our customers to see. In fact, I would say right now when somebody downloads Zangati, about 80% of the cases we will identify storage latency issues that they were not even aware of. Uh, and we're parsing the very same data that everybody else is from vCenter. Um, part of that is that, you know, believe it or not, uh, even for your tier one applications, there are very short-term storage latency fluctuations, it's probably worth going to the data store piece, mm -hmm. that happen where you can you know, go from 10 milliseconds to 100 and then back down again in a 20 second interval. And for a database driven application, that's significant. Uh, for a desktop, that's significant. So this you know, kind of live continuous pulse, um, you know, even on the storage side, has is, is been very helpful for customers on the server side. No, I mean, you, I mean, if you do have that data store problem, it could be in a number of locations. It could be a faulty HPA, it could be a bent or damaged cable, it could be a faulty SP, it could be ownership across two storage processes. Absolutely. Cancers. Can, can Zingati go up to any further and actually identi identify along that track where that problem is? Or I just know I've got uh, a spike in, in latency on the data store. But the, we're knowing about that problem, right? That's a good question. The Zangati product is, is it, where it really excels is getting you to the point of the problem very, very quickly. I'll give you an example. I was actually at one of the major server vendors, International Galactic Headquarters. You know, they'd be one of the top three or four server Galactic vendors Galactic. on, on the market. <laughs> um, I was in their executive brief. I was in their executive briefing center, and they were preparing for a major demo for a Fortune 100 company. And so, as you can imagine, they make the storage gear, they make the server gear, and they've got plenty of smart people in the room, right, in order to make this work. And they're having problems installing applications and whatever. We installed the Zangati um, for them. And um, about five minutes after the dashboard is up, I said, I think you have a storage latency problem. And of course, all the smart people in the room turn and look at the new guy and say, yeah, right. You know, I mean, they make the gear for crying out loud, right? They've, they've built this environment by hand with their smartest people, and their own storage tool is not saying there's a problem. And I said, well, I'm showing you that I, I'm showing that the hypervisor is experiencing about 3,000 milliseconds or three seconds of storage latency um, on an intermittent basis. And they looked at me kind of with that, okay, wise guy, what's your next move? You know, since you want to be the smart guy telling us what's wrong with our environment, why don't you tell us what's wrong? I said, they said, what would you do next? I said, why don't you open your storage console and see what it says? So they opened up their storage specific tool and it predictably showed that the internal latency to the array was like three to five milliseconds, right? I mean, exactly what you'd expect. Because they've averaged it out and they've got rid of the peaks. Well, that's exactly what had happened. And, you know, the latency inside their system was rather unremarkable. It was right at 20 to 30 milliseconds kind of view, right? And at that point, one of their people said, oh, look, there's an alarm on it. Go click on that. And so someone went and clicked on it. And sure enough, there in the log, there's 25% TCP retransmits and all the network interfaces coming out of, this, out, of this, <laughs> out of this array. At this point, the network guy, who was the big skeptic, jumps up and says, hang on. And he goes and runs behind the glass wall uh, in the demo center. And he pokes his head back out. Is it fixed yet? No. Is it fixed yet? No. Third time he comes back, I say, yeah, that, that made a huge difference. What'd you do? And he said, well, I pulled a cable. I said, spanning tree loop? He said, yeah. <laughs> and that's what it was. They had a spanning tree thing that was kind of coming and going for them. Um, 
inside their environment. I, I come to find out they'd actually been struggling in this environment for two weeks trying to deploy applications in it, and sometimes they'd go smoothly and sometimes they didn't. And they were starting to blame all the various application vendors for the install problems. And the reality is it was just a storage latency thing that had gone away. So in that particular case, did we come all the way down and say that it was a spanning tree problem? No. But did we get them to exactly the point where a smart person could figure it out within literally three minutes? Yes. And so from that standpoint, I think that if we as a, a vendor can clear 85 or 90% of the infrastructure instantly and basically say, here's the area, here's the time frame, you know, maybe even down to a minute or two, I mean, if there's any kind of log you know, analysis or any kind of deeper troubleshooting that has to happen, it's fairly narrowly confined at that point. Okay. So the other, next question is, like obviously the products evolved quite a bit from when I first looked at the guys a couple of years ago, additional kind of resources being monitored. Where do you see the product going in the next 12 months to 18 months now? Where do you see the gaps in what you're doing that you know that you're going to plug and add more features and functionality? So we're, we actually have uh, the last about 20 minutes or so where we want to specifically focus on, on where we go next. All right, okay. So um, we will do that, and we'll also we're interested in your feedback. What you know, what I'm clearly hearing, right? And you know, it's worth noting that the product has evolved in the kind of data feeds we can get, right? And to yeah. your to your question, it is starting to become more of a request. Well, why can't you go deeper into storage, you know, particularly? And that is something that with some of our larger partners. Uh, we'll begin exploring, but I, I don't want to jump on that. Yeah. That part, we'll come back to it. The other thing I would say is the VDI kind of angle is a good example. But don't make that your only one. No, no, actually, it's because then you then it kind of oh, this is a VDI thing. Oh, yeah. well, we don't do VDI significantly. Then it kind of there are other applications where this technology could be used, and so you need to like go for sure. It, you know, well, and it, it's worth noting, and I'll, I'll uh, you know answer you next. But it is worth noting, just to be clear, you know. Um, Zangati's largest implementations are on the server virtualization side. Okay. Uh, north of 65% of our customers are server virtualization customers. Uh, uh, some are hybrids, like uh, you know, Roger, I think, uses those for both server and, and VDI. I think in Wayne's organization, it's mostly VDI at this point. Um, but it is worth noting that you know, the server virtualization admins have, you know, the, are the ones who, frankly, are, are living day to day with the blame wars. Um, and actually, I'll come back to another point about how we can enable server virtualization admins to deal with application owners. So I'll, I'll talk about that, but Ed had a question first. Question of two. One is, are you connecting directly to the network switches, the virtual switches, or and are you connecting directly to the storage device? Or are you all getting all that information from Visa? Great. That's a, that's a very important question. Next one is, um, can you define an application in here? And not only that, can you pull that application from how I've already defined it inside of oh, vCenter, if I'm using vApps? If I'm using vCloud Director, I use vApps in there and I use vApps defined in that way. I could be using Virtual Infrastructure Navigator to define my apps. I could be using VMware's APM to define my apps. I could be using VCOps Enterprise to define my apps. Can you get my app definition somehow into here without me having to re-enter it? Because that's just a pain. This is Peter. I need to re-enter it 17 different times. Yeah. Right. Fair enough. Um, good. So I'll take it. I'll take it in the, the pieces that you gave it to me. The network information we do get directly from the from the network switches. Uh, we're able to get information from the standard switches, from VMware's distributed switches. We're able to get information from the Nexus 1000V. We're able to get information from uh, Citrix's switches, uh, particularly if what's the, called the Open V switch is implemented in there. That's something that they put into uh, their product line about a year ago. Um, we've been able to work with, uh, with that Open V switch for, for quite some time. So we can definitely get information directly from those. From the virtual switches, but what about the physical switches? Yes. The slave chassis. Um, now, in the physical network, we get information from any device that supports a family of technologies known as NetFlow. 
Um, Cisco are the ones that originally made it, but it's available from you know Dell and HP and Extreme and Juniper and a bunch of others under a variety of different kind of trade names, S Flow and J Flow and IP Fix and you know things like that. So we're able to get information out of the physical infrastructure from a variety of firewalls, um, you know, routers, switches, and other things, and that ends up being particularly useful if you need to track interactions back to user communities. Um, so that enables us to you know certainly find out what else is on a pipe and you know a variety of things like that. It's been useful to some of our VDI customers in particular for um, you know, doing WAN planning and WAN implementations uh, and you know, tuning PC over IP across WAN connections are, are places where that data has come in particularly usefully. Um, the application, to take the second part of your question, did I get that for you? What about the storage? Oh, what about the storage? Uh, the storage today we're taking from a hypervisor perspective out of the vSphere API. We are not going directly to the storage today. So, if you, because hypervisors can, are known to lie about storage. They have in the past and they always will. They could see a latency that literally just doesn't exist. So, the question then becomes is that how can I use Zeragati's tool to prove that it's actually somewhere in the storage layer versus in the hypervisor layer? Because it could be something simple as SIOC through it started firing for no reason at all, and now I have latency on half my machines when I should. Right, right. And I think that you know there are several things. I mean, a you heard from Jagan that the infrastructure is extensible, and the possibility of adding additional metrics is certainly something that we welcome. I mean, we like to have metrics for breakfast. That's kind of what we live off of. And the more the merrier from that perspective. It obviously takes time to build, you know, connectors into you know every different, you know, kind of environment. But you know, we welcome it, especially if there are vendors that want to give us a feed that say we'll give you this information and just push it to you. That makes us very happy. So you know, we're very open to that sort of thing. The other thing that I would say, just in general, is that if if there's some kind of issue with storage and we're narrowing it down to a particular collection of VMs to a particular data store, you know, so on and so forth, those are, it's again getting things down to where it's fairly fast and efficient for someone who knows what they're doing to, you know, get into the, the exact problem area and, and, you know, get there. So Could I extend Zangati by providing my own SMIS provider? Because SMIS speaks to just about everything so that I can feed it into your system easily. Is that doable by a human, or do you guys need Zangati to do it? Um, and if that's, the, if that's the case, that's the most basic one you should provide. Right. You know, there are a number of, of hooks inside the system that allow people to trigger recordings right now. We've opened up something that allows vCenter to trigger our recordings. Um, you know, end users can do it, as you saw. So you know, for us to make another programmatic way for something to interact with our system, uh, would not be a big deal. This is for collection. Right. Understood. Okay. Yeah, so I mean, the, the answer is today that, that, you know, that isn't a data feed that we have, but um, again, we can certainly, it's something that it's interesting to get that feedback. Um, one of the things, um, you know, I, I also just kind of uh, looking at just what people are kind of poking around at, um, you know, I, I think one of the things that's worth giving people a sense of is just kind of the navigation capabilities. Yes, that's what I would um, like to but do. But as well that it's, it exists both for the live system as well as kind of reporting um, that you can navigate around. Very good. Okay. So, ouch. What's that? I said ouch. Ouch? I was wrong. Well, I tweeted that because uh, when I looked at it, so okay. if you could show it that I wanted to look at like a historical thing. So okay. I had a look at... Uh, yeah, the last, I think the longest I could do was three months, 12 weeks okay. of a historical graph of uh, something, and it came up with a report. Yep. And if I wanted to jump back another one, I had to rerun the report. So I didn't think that was interactive. Very good. So, um, I, I, all I can tell you on that one is stay tuned. Um, you know, we've, worried, we've, we've got some UI things that are... Does that mean I was right, or does it mean I was wrong? Well, I mean, well I, the data is there in terms of it... Um, you know, let, let me just show you a little bit about, about how to navigate inside the tool. And then if I haven't answered your question, push back on me and yeah. keep me honest. How's that? Yeah. Um, so from, from just about anywhere, almost everything in the dashboard is hyperlinked. So if I click on a metric on the front, it takes me from the dashboard into what we call the monitor view. And the monitor view just puts the various columns of the dashboard off to the left. So I can sort things by VMs and hosts or by desktops and hosts and the one that you have. 
And so if I go to um, you know, like the list of VMs, uh, anything that's in alert or alarm you know, will show up with something. And if I go ahead and uh, you know, pick off one of, these, um, you know, one of these particular virtual machines, uh, it'll basically take me to a live view for this particular thing. And you'll basically get a display that has six boxes on it. And the six boxes represent some of the roughly two to three dozen different things that we keep. The things that you would want to note are, first of all, that uh, there's, a, there's a little tick box in the upper right-hand corner, and this is what allows you to change out what metric is displayed. So if you think, well, golly, I don't see the, you know, the memory, or I don't see the storage latency, or I don't see the IOPS, um, it's just as simple as going up to that corner and basically finding the metric that you're looking for. From this live view, it's possible to do several different things. And what I'm going to do is flip back over so I'm in the VDI dashboard like you guys are, because you could actually um, you do what I'm about to do um, you know, yourself. So I'm going to go to the monitor view. I'm going to sort uh, via desktops. And it's going to list all of the desktops here. And I'm going to go ahead and just pick off one of these desktops. Now, what we notice when I pick off the desktop is that this one does have a problem. What is a problem is highlighted in orange. It's pretty hard to miss. It's pretty glaring. There's a lot of memory usage here. Now in terms of desktops, it's great that it's using a lot of memory. It's apparently outside the ordinary from our system. Wouldn't it be great if we could actually know what was eating the memory and whether we should be concerned about it? And this is where Zangati has got several different things, information sources uh, that Jagan mentioned. One of them is from the endpoint itself. And there's this system performance button that's in the upper right-hand corner of the user interface. If I click this system performance, there's two items here. One says Windows System and one says Desktop Session. I'm going to click on the Windows System first. And what this does is it opens up a WMI browser. Now, mine's cached. Yours may take about 30 to 45 seconds to actually load because it takes a little bit of time to log into WMI and get this information synchronized with the timeline that we've got in our main dashboard. And what it's doing is basically showing what are the things that are consuming CPU right now and what are the processes that are consuming memory. And so for a lot of the user-oriented you know, things that happen with people running out of RAM or locking a browser up or you know, having some application that gets stuck that can be solved by a Control-Alt-Delete, all of those kind of things just bubble right to the top of this um, you know, this user interface. So this information is all recordable. When we're doing an automated recording, we try to get this information for any Windows system, whether it's a server or a desktop. Uh, this, this works just as well for you know, Windows 2000 as it does for a Windows 7 desktop. You know, WMI is basically supported on all Windows you know, things since about um, you know, 2000. So um, that's a very useful thing. Uh, one that's specific to VDI, that one's a little bit more general, but if we take a look at one of my uh, desktops here, this VMware 1, I know is a, is a, is a decent example. Uh, if you go to that system performance button and choose the desktop session, uh, you can see it's going gonna, it's gonna to load for me here. Um, but what this is going to do is actually attach directly to the view agent that's running inside the desktop. So in view 5, VMware uh, produced an API that allows us to talk directly to the view agent. And we are pulling information directly out of there for display that you used to, to get only by looking at the log files uh, the, you know, for, you know, out, of the, out of the desktop. So that's pretty slow. Uh, this, the interface that you're about to see was actually kind of half designed by VMware's PSO and about the other half by Teradici's PSO. And it was specifically designed to kind of call those things out. The other good thing to, to point out is that all of this information is available in our tool for Citrix's HDX protocol as well. So even though I'm going to show it to you in view, every single one of these metrics is actually available uh, for Citrix desktops as well, because I'm sure that there's um, you know, folk out on the internet at the very least, um, and maybe in the room, that um, you know, support a Citrix environment. And so as this comes in here, you can see that it's going to basically graph out what the end-to-end -end latency is for this particular session. It's going to do a PC over IP bitrate decomposition. So it's basically going to show how much of the bandwidth um, you know, is being used by um, you know, audio, how much of it by USB, how much of it um, you know, for, uh, for the video feed itself. And then the packet loss is also graphed. Uh, if you've ever had the problem of trying to track down packets that are stuck inside of a WAN um, 
you know, buffer or you know, just getting deprioritized across a WAN, being able to see the packet loss is huge because that's probably the earliest indication that you've got stuff hung up inside of, of a router buffer somewhere um, or a, a, a router for my, for my friend from, uh, from England over here. <laughs> Our IP routers. Um, so this information, again, is all recordable. You can actually have up to 10 of these open on the screen at once. Uh, it was determined by uh, some of the Teradici guys that that's actually tremendously important if you're going to optimize a WAN connection with a bunch of um, PC over IP flowing across it because the, the protocol is actually interactive. It's actually sensitive to the number of other things on the link. And so by being able to graph several of these simultaneously, uh, you actually have this rich real-time information to literally turn knobs and dials about the user experience, about the compression, about multimedia settings, and some of those other things that are a part of the, uh, of the VMware you know, experience. And similar things are in Citrix, obviously. Yes, sir? So with like Mitel and Cisco coming out with um, VDI you know, call and video capability, are you going to be able to actually look into a more granular view on that? So you actually pull out like what, what video and percentage is being used by the VDI images across the that All those things are certainly possible. Right. So, I mean, maybe, you know, David will want to touch on, on something there during his section with, uh, with Joggin. But what I can tell you in broad terms is that this capability of drilling into a running session um, has been very attractive to the various vendors that we support. And they've all got ideas about how it could be extended because no one's ever had this before to be able to look inside a running session and say, what's going on in there? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think I've only seen one other tool that can do that, and that's a guy in Crystal Lake, Illinois, that just coded his own thing and released it. It's either a fling or he just put it out there. Chuck? Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and again, as Nathaniel says, it's, it's we're working directly both with VMware and Citrix with, you know, so we just literally came out, again, talk about new feeds, we added the HDX protocol. They manifest their session information a little bit differently. And the reality is uh, it provides us the opportunity, as Nathaniel says, to collaborate with both VMware and Citrix and Teradici and maybe even the, the router guys to, to get more granular about those insights. Um, you know, because there are certainly options, uh, I believe, Cisco is even potentially looking at cutting the video out separate from the PC or IP or the HDX. And from a network standpoint, we can certainly see that. But um, a lot of that is, early, is nascent with their VXI architecture. Yeah. That's, that's, that's kind of why I asked the question, yeah. I think the more we start to do that, yeah. to get around with the, the, the loop Yeah. Um, do we want to sh uh, highlight, we were talking about reporting as well, just to mm -hmm. show people that. Uh, you know, I, I, I think just how we can jump from an object to a report and then also navigate uh, from one object that's related. Yes. Um, so when you're on the, the monitor screen and you're looking at any particular object, like here we have a desktop, it's possible to just double click on the storage and instantly you know, be taken to the storage. It's possible from the storage to go to any of the hosts uh, that are also connected to this storage. And so the, the navigational capability to move around the environment fast is pretty much unparalleled. And just a quick thing on the storage, because I wanted to highlight storage latency for a second on that uh, data store, because <laughs> it happened right before our eyes. But the idea of doing of seeing fluctuations would uh, is that one we were already looking at? Um, I think I think this was the one. Okay. Well, I mean, it was the one that was open, but there was there was basically a fluctuation that li you know literally happened where we were looking at. Uh, if you scroll backwards, it went from nothing to a very significant fluctuation. And, and up and down again, you saw it go up above a quarter. Yeah, there it is, second. to seven to seven hundred. So this is what's happening in your environments, in your customer environments, kind of a, on a steady state basis. And then when we try to look at it from a reporting standpoint, sorry, to, sorry to interrupt, Daniel. So when you're looking at any object, you'll notice that there is a report button in the upper right hand corner. And so if we um, you know, go back here to um, you know, something and basically hit the report button, it will kind of pre-fill out all of the information for whatever the particular object is. And all you have to do is basically pick off the timeline uh, you know, to see what's happening. Uh, like if I run a one hour report on this particular VM that I'm actually doing this um, you know, demonstration from, it'll go ahead and churn out some things about you know, my particular desktop. What's interesting about these reports is that they certainly enable you to go back in time and get the information out of our system. It's also worth noting every bit of this information is also accessible via an API. 
So the Zangati system is actually extremely open on the back end. Um, you know, I know there's people in this room that are scripting junkies and you know, don't have any problem uh, with the idea of you know, you know, using a little shell script or something to rip a whole bunch of data out that's useful. So there is a full API completely documented. The documentation is actually even good. You can actually use it. It's got <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know if anybody else has played with an API, but sometimes they don't exactly make it easy to get in the first time, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, all the helper code is in there to like, use the little SOAP API and you know, kind of get in and make a query or two. And all you have to do is basically substitute the variables and you know, kind of away you go. But uh, the reports are rich. Uh, they basically, you know, contain all of the information. If you mouse over, um, it, it's a useful technique. Um, it'll, it'll show you the instantaneous values for the samples as you roll across. So you can actually read out what the particulars are uh, for any of the samples. That's a clever little thing. And the other thing that's also worth noting, oh, it's not in yet. Um, is that on the top end graphs where it basically says the top end protocols or things like that, if you right click, you can actually zoom into that particular object in the report and it'll basically take you interactively even through the reports. And that ends up being very useful if you spot something like storage latency or CPU ready where it's a contention based metric. The whole idea would be, of course, if you've got CPU ready, well, who's contending and for how long and when? And when you can just right click in some of the reports and get there, uh, it, it tends to, to speed things up uh, you know, quite a bit. So uh, if you guys play around with Zangati on your own, um, you'll highly recommend the overall report to you um, out of the, uh, the main Zangati dashboard. And um, you know, certainly you know, a number of these summary reports are, are also very useful. But I think that you know, as we kind of wind down the, um, the, the demo portion of this, um, you know, the thing that I'd like to leave you with is just the overriding sense that being able to get anywhere in your infrastructure instantly is of significant value. Um, if any of you have had to struggle with you know, trying to get the real-time views in vCenter to be responsive and try to juggle back and forth between two or three different items, I think you know of what I speak. Um, you know, the search box in the upper right-hand corner is definitely your friend. I mean, if you're supporting several thousand desktops or um, you know, server objects, the ability to type any part of an IP address, a host name, a MAC address, um, you know, into that search box and find something and be there now um, and then access their historical reports as well as the now and flip back and forth between those uh, ends up being significantly useful if you're engaged in day-to-day -day support of infrastructure. So. And, and, and Sorry, go ahead. So, two questions. What's the, uh, what kind of granularity can you do for role-based access control, and then how is the licensing divvied up? Okay, very good. Um, so role-based access control, each user that logs into the dashboard can basically set up a variety of different, like when they adjust different views for as far as like the order of columns and things like that, those all tie back um, to the username, as well as like setting up things like there's this favorite area for certain items that would automatically preload every time that you logged in. So for example, if you were you know, I don't know, looking at a particular group of servers or they were particularly critical, you might have certain things loaded where somebody else that logs in might have other things, um, you know, that would basically load in. So there's some customization that can basically be done. And um, the, other, the other thing I'll add is we, we have this concept, uh, Nathaniel alluded to it, but, um, you know, and again, we can kind of show you guys offline. We have this idea of a remote, remote object viewer, the idea that you can actually give a special login to the owner of a data store. A, a server owner. So this idea we talked about the um, end user compute user going to the visual trouble ticket portal, we can actually give an app owner a login to their server. They can take a look at that server, kind of self, self help. Uh, this is very popular in our test and dev customer environments. And if they still have an issue, they can actually initiate a recording yeah, like as well. If the, if the manager, the dev team, I don't want him looking at any of the stuff. Yeah, like correct. Isolated to a specific resource pool, or, or a specific server, or a grouping of servers. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah we absolutely. Use, we had our, all of our executives run VDI, so mm -hmm. we tailored a dashboard just to the executives. So someone's always watching that thing because it's pretty kind of. And you can do applications too. You can group them how you want. Okay. Now, can you? Is this role-based access control tied to groups in active directories? Is it tied to vCenter? to tie to SCVVM, where's it tied back to? Because if I have to maintain yet another set of RBAC, this is a useless tool, seriously. Because it's just not gonna happen. I have to maintain 17 now, adding one more. The straw that breaks the camel's back. You got it, it's yeah. just not worth it. Yeah, 
And uh, you know, to, to that end, you know, Active Directory authentication is something that for well, us is authentication. I'm talking about RMAP. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I understand. I understand. It, it's it's bundled to bundled together for us, um, and and that's that's literally a matter of weeks away. So you know, by the time that you know, I know I'm not shipping it to you today, but that's something that's fundamentally complete inside engineering. So what about tying it? So for example, if I'm going to allow a cloud tenant to see this. Are you tying it to vCloud Director's RBAC? No. No, there's no specific tie-in to vCloud Director today. What about any of the other cloud capabilities? And why not tie it back to vCenter? So I have to define it in vCenter anyways for dev tests. Why not tie it back to that or give me the option at least to do one of them at any moment? Sure. Sure. Valid. Yeah, I mean, again, we, you know, we're open to any suggestions in terms of grouping. You know, right now it's, our, our grouping tends to be uh, kind of have a, have a host-based or a network-based orientation, but there's a lot of flexibility that we certainly should explore. You can have it really dynamic for vCloud Director, but you could, you could tie it to a virtual center with inside of it, though. Or, Absolutely. Or groups. And you know, at uh, you know, certainly at VMworld, I mean, that's exactly what we did. Is we were monitoring infrastructure that was actually v VCD run infrastructure, right? Um, you know, we weren't tying to VCD, but we were still looking at all the underlying infrastructure because it's ESX hosts and vCenters and virtual machines and vSwitches and you know all of that. So we were still managing the infrastructure, even though it was VCD that was provisioning it over the top. Yeah, I'm opposed to using vCenter, defining permissions on vCenter to. Get the access for this tool. That seems silly. I would rather use Active Directory or tie it into how vCloud does yeah, I'm fine with that, already. But I don't want to define a permission to a group in the vCenter just to give them access to a monitor. That seems insecure. Well, the other thing that's worth noting, and again, I, I, I think we're kind of running up into Steve's segment, so we'll, we'll uh, transition in a second. But it's also worth noting that these recordings can be shared, coming back to kind of access and, and how you want people to see only what you want them to see. Forget about even logins, but if I need to have a storage admin or a network admin or you know, actually a, a cloud customer see what's happening, I can just push them a recording. Okay. They don't even need to log into the Zangadi, and it's just a focused, isolated recording. Just give them like a it's, a, it's an HTML link. Obscure link. Yeah, you know, just a, a custom link that goes back to a recording. Yeah, I mean, and basically what they get is in a web browser, they just get one of these recordings. That's all that's in the whole thing is the ability to scroll back and forth. And we've had a number of our virtual administrator customers been able to share these like with a storage team or something else because predictably the storage guy doesn't see the latency or, you know, whatever, right? Not my problem. Well, well, yeah, and, and, it, and it's, it's, it just ends up being a question of visibility. Is there sufficient granularity to see it? Um, you know, it turns out there's just a difference if one tool summarizing over 15 minutes and another summarizing over 15 seconds or over one second. Um, you just see things, you see the world a different way, and oftentimes when everybody can see the same thing the same way, all of a sudden then people just go solve the problem. And, uh, you know, it's not about whose fault it is, it's about how fast we can get it resolved. And that, that's the ultimate win, right? Okay, uh, I think we're going to transition and then come back. Uh, oh, wait, was there one more question? Okay. I just can't see anything. I, the, you can't see anything through the UI? I mean, you're, this is not connected? It's connected. Huh. No, the thing in the corner, you say it was live. I don't care what it says. It's just, it's connected. It's just unshowing. Is, it, is there a way with the clients to get the PC over IP base for people coming in over, like, it's matted? In other words, if you're going through the secure gateway, yeah, the secure gateway is is a pretty opaque piece of technology today. Um, you know what what we'll have access to is the uh, the desktop agent's view of the world. So the actual PC over IP session in that case is typically just between the desktop and the security gateway, right? And so that's what ends up getting reflected inside of our tool. That's where the session actually is. There's really two sessions, right? It's not end-to-end -end through the security gateway. And at least today, there's no mechanism in the security gateway for us to get the other half of the connection. That's not exposed to us. Um, I can see the
can see the recordings there, right? Yeah.